Hello, my beloved New Testament students. Sorry to be giving you this long distance lecture. Uh, I, uh, I probably will call for me when we meet again next Tuesday, uh, uh, the coming Tuesday lesson, uh, to atone some way with cookies and pints or something, but uh, don't count on it. I'm, uh, I need to tell you a couple things uh, in terms of just announcements to keep us going in class, even though we're not meeting, obviously, for this Thursday class. Uh, let me see if I've got my PowerPoints here. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, we, our next writing assignment will be on Tuesday's lesson, and then it will have a two-week sequence. Okay? The second is you might be thinking during these <clears throat> kind of slow times, uh, of the second installment on the outside commentary, the Believing Christ installment, uh, which is about 40 pages, <clears throat> posted on the internet. And then the third is something that I haven't mentioned before, but, uh, but I want to mention it now, and that is, with today's lesson, we'll be talking about the Passover meal uh, and the Passover celebration and its significance in Jewish holidays. Uh, towards the end of March the last week or so of March and the first couple weeks of April, there's a BYU professor that has consented to put on uh, a Passover meal uh, with, uh, for the student community. And the meal is, is very authentic as Passovers are celebrated in Jewish families uh, every year. And it, uh, it's a little bit pricey because it's a three and a half hour catered meal with, with like seven courses and different foods and things. But um, a donor stepped forward and they actually subsidize it. The normal ticket is $17 and they subsidize it uh, uh, $7 a ticket. So uh, there's some coupons that I have if you want to get those and you can attend the Passover meal for just $10 per person. Uh, the coupons are a little bit tight to come by, so uh, I can't just give them out wholesale to you and all your friends, but since you're in my New Testament class, towards the end of the semester, we will be talking specifically about the Last Supper, which is the most famous of all Passover meals. And so, if you'll just be aware, here's the information on the, uh, on the Passover meals, and I'll bring those with me next time and, uh, and give them out on a first-come, first-served basis. Okay? All right, well, with that in mind, uh, if we were together, uh, we would have sung The Lord is My Light, uh, one of our great LDS hymns. Uh, since we're not together, I won't sing it to you. Okay, I know that's going to break your heart, all right, but, uh, uh, but as long as you say a little prayer in your heart that you might feel the Spirit during this, uh, during this lecture, uh, I've said one on my part uh, as well. All right, well, let's jump in then, and today's lesson... Number 15, we cover, I am the light of the world. It is, uh, it is another classic example of John using symbolism in his recorded accounts to teach us more about the Savior. Okay? And the, and the great symbolism that he uses in this lesson is Jesus is the true light. Now, the lesson covers, appropriately, the material covers from John 7 through John 10. I'm not going to cover 10 today. I'll just paste that in with next time's lesson uh, because there's so much material just in 7 through 9. But what I'd like to, to uh, forward your mind to is this idea. John uses specifically the image of light to teach us more about who Jesus Christ is. And he does that quite skillfully in these chapters. The first uh, that he does with the, uh, with I am the, uh, well, the, the, the high point of his using Jesus' as light has to be in chapter 9 when he says, uh, uh, I am the light of the world. Or no, I'm sorry, when he says, uh, I am, uh, he heals the man that's born blind. And then he reveals himself to the man that's born blind, and he shows him spiritual light. And then at the end of that experience, if you want to look at it, it's in John chapter 9. 
at the end of that experience, it starts about in verse uh, uh, 39, there's kind of a little monologue in which Jesus is just sort of talking there, and, and, uh, and he just says, I, I've come to bring light into the world that those that see uh, might not see, and those that see not might see. And it parallels very strongly uh, the man that's born blind. Well, that's, that's probably his, his best example of Jesus as the light to the world. Uh, he does use a couple of other examples, which I might point out to you. Uh, one is in chapter 8, where he stands up and says, I am the light of the world. Uh, that one is a, uh, just a, a, an obvious reference to Jesus being the light. But what example just, or what incident just precedes that in chapter 8? It's Jesus uh, uh, interacting with the woman that's taken in adultery. Now, when Jesus interacts with the woman that's taken in adultery, what's the, what's the symbolic thing of that whole message there before he says, I am the light of the world? It's the fact that he is surrounded by darkness, people committing dark sins. Now, you might say, well, the woman taken in adultery has committed a dark sin. Um, that, that certainly is true, but... Guess what? When they brought her to have her condemned and to, and to play the Jesus up uh, against the law in a difficult situation as to which law he would obey, the Roman law or the Jewish law, um, they only brought the woman. But interesting, that crime or that sin actually takes how, how many people need to be involved for the sin to even be committed. There has to be a man, but the man is not there. Why? It's an obvious setup. And they just told the man to get lost, whoever it was that, that sold his soul and went out and, uh, and committed adultery with this woman. Uh, he's not even there. So the example is an obvious setup. And John uses it, I believe, as an example of bringing the woman. She's coming out of, she's, in t she's, she's just immersed in darkness. And he brings her then to his light and sets her on a pathway of repentance uh, and forgiveness. And then he says, I am the light of the world. Uh, okay. Now there's one other one that you might actually see quite forcefully, and that uh, is in John chapter 7. It has that notable example of Nicodemus, and even when it cites the example of Nicodemus in John chapter 7, it says in our text, John records, he that came to Jesus, what? By night. So John is reminding you that Nicodemus comes by night. This is the second appearance of Nicodemus. And what happens there? Nicodemus is confronted, or, or the soldiers are supposed to have arrested Nicodemus. They come back and say, never man spake like this man. We've, we felt something deeply in our hearts. And what are, the, what are the mercenaries, what are the Pharisees, and those who hired the soldiers uh, say to the soldiers? What? We didn't hire you to think. We hired you to do our dirty work. You were supposed to arrest this guy. And then Nicodemus steps forth. It's about verse, what is it, 50 or so. And he says, well, wait a second, colleagues. Uh, aren't we supposed to have just cause before we go out and arrest this guy and charge him? And they turn around and turn on Nicodemus. And what do they say? Search and see, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. They throw the flimsiest thing at him. And then this person who's... Come to Jesus by night, we've been reminded of that, trying now to step out into the, into the light and defend Jesus, and instead, uh, what, uh, what happens? Uh, he recedes back into the darkness. Okay? So there's three examples then, uh, very forceful examples, I believe, of John working with light. Okay? And so that's the image that we want to carry through today's lesson, uh, and we want to think about it. Uh, it's the second great I am statement. Uh, the first that we had in the lesson before was what? I am the bread of life. And now it's I am the light of the world. John loves the I am statements. And so we'll see him use it uh, four or five times during his gospel. Okay. Well, uh, are there any questions? Too bad. <laughs> I'm hiding behind this camera and you can't uh, ask questions. So, ooh, we're going we're gonna to get done on time. But you know what? 
I don't even have a clock today that I have to worry about, so but you might get extra for your tuition today. Okay, I'll try to keep it at 50 minutes just because I know uh, you can only handle so much of Brother Wilson. All right, uh, so let me take you on first on some, some images. In John chapter 7, when we open up, there's a passage there about Jesus going to the feast. Do you remember reading that? And it says he doesn't go into the feast, okay? Uh, and let's, let me just flip my scriptures there. He says he doesn't go, uh, well, it identifies the feast in the second verse. Now, the Jewish feast of tabernacles was at hand. And then it goes into his brother and said, well, wait a second, it's kind of dangerous uh, for, for us to go in there together. And so Jesus sends his, his, his disciples in without him, and he comes in discreetly. Do you have a feel for, for what time of year the Feast of Tabernacles would be? The Feast of Tabernacles is in the fall. And so scholars surmise that this is already two and a half years into Jesus' ministry. So if it's in the fall, then it tells you that it's probably October, that general time frame, and uh, there's already so much opposition that Jesus dare, doesn't dare go back into Jerusalem. See, uh, Galilee's his safe zone, and he doesn't dare go back into Jerusalem until, or, or in full daylight, uh, with his entourage, because he fears that they would arrest him. All right? Uh, okay, so there you have the stage. Now, it, it behooves us now to talk just briefly about uh, why or what we call in uh, the Mosaic Law, the pilgrimage feasts, okay? Three times in the Mosaic Law, the Lord commanded Moses to instruct his people to pilgrimage back to the temple and to offer sacrifices, okay? Now, they had lots of daily sacrifices, but these were three uh, what, what are known as pilgrimage feasts that all devout Jews were supposed to celebrate, okay? Uh, Let's go to a slide here. Uh, yeah, let's get to the right one. So, so here's a 1830s wa watercolor series of how Jerusalem looked back then, and, and probably quite similar to what it would have been in Jesus' time. The only difference would have been, in, instead of the Dome of the Rock, it would have been Herod's Temple right there, uh, minus the minarets. But, so here's, we're coming in on this view uh, from the north, east corner, okay, and uh, here's where the Jerusalem Center sits today, and, uh, and so this would have been the path that pilgrims would have taken uh, into the holy city there, okay? Uh, now, so three times they were supposed to pick up and go down, all right? Here's, a, here's from the south side, so Dome of the Rock again, uh, al Ask Mosque, uh, and then the City of David right down here, and then this is the Kidron Valley, okay, um, and we'll talk more about that uh, uh, as we get uh, towards the end of Jesus' life. Okay, so, <clears throat> like I said, there were three feasts in which all Jews were commanded to go back to Jerusalem. The first, and the one of highest importance, greatest importance, the granddaddy of them all, the feast that's similar to our Christmas kind of emphasis, was the Feast of Passover. Passover was celebrated uh, at, the, at, the, at the first kind of uh, beginnings of spring, and, and from the Passover feast today, we even get the, the calendaring for uh, where we locate Easter, which is a huge mistake because we never know when Easter is. But nonetheless, Passover was celebrated at that time, so it would have been late March, uh, mid-April. Uh, uh, mid it was the, se the season. It was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was commemorating Exodus chapter uh, uh, 13, and Exodus chapter 11, when the, when the Jews uh, exit Egypt, uh, and, uh, and the Pharaoh says, get out of my life, uh, get lost, and, and so the, the Exodus there. So it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was an eight-day feast, and it was a very devout feast that all Jews, uh, even pretty much today, still celebrate. Okay? It was the biggie. The second most important festival for them was the Feast of Tabernacles. This was their equivalent of our Thanksgiving feast, but it was held in October, usually early October, and the Feast of Tabernacles gets its name from the Hebrew word Sukkot, or Sukkot, uh, meaning booth. And what it was is it was commemorating their harvest, and during the harvest in October, they would go out 
And in the law of Moses, they were commanded to build little huts or tabernacles and celebrate God's goodness to them in the harvest, okay, as they harvested their, their, their crops and things. And during this time, it was also an eight-day celebration, they would remain in these huts, they would actually sleep out there and have their meals and everything in these little kind of teepee type shelters and they would burn uh, over the fires that they built they would burn green tree branches so that the smoke would ascend up through this teepee like structure and uh, the, so the smoke symbolized carrying their thanks up to heaven so this was the feast of Sukkot or uh, in gathering it also is celebrated today uh, quite uh, fastidiously by devout Jews okay uh, and then the, the third in the sequence of pilgrimage feasts was the Feast of Pentecost. That was done 50 days after tabernacles, okay, hence the word penta, five, for uh, uh, five weeks, let's see, no, uh, five day, or 50 days. Uh, and it was called the first of fruits, fir, Feast of First Fruits, uh, and it was uh, commemorating their early grain harvest. The Feast of Pentecost was much smaller during Jesus' time, and I suspect that for devout Jews, sometimes they compromised on this one and not make, didn't make the big trip down to Jerusalem, depending on the distance. But they almost always, they, they always would go in for Passover, and Tabernacles was also a, a large celebration for them. Uh, today, in our calendar, Pentecost is quite a bit larger uh, in the Christian world. Do you know why? Because in Acts chapter 2, they were celebrating their day of Pentecost, and they had a great outpouring of the Spirit. Hence, the term Pentecost now has come to mean for us uh, uh, a spiritual kind of uh, outpouring of spiritual gifts, especially gifts of tongue, and a whole branch of Christianity. The Pentecostals really focus on the gift of tongues. and, uh, and uh, Anyway, so those are the three festivals. Now let me show you some pictures, especially uh, about uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, since that's the one that Jesus is celebrating today. Get a look at this. When I first saw this, uh, uh, this image, uh, the thought that came to my mind was, that's a boy's fort. Because they just have some, some lumber usually, uh, some, some type of thing to do walls, and they, they erect it. They then go inside and eat their meals. The top of it almost always has some green associated with it. And so they've got it here. When I, uh, like I said, when I first saw this, I thought, that's a boy's fort. The only thing that's missing from the boy's fort is just a sign right over here that would say, no girls allowed. But uh, anyway, uh, so you get the feel for it. It's kind of similar. The, the, the Orthodox Jews today, it's somewhat like our uh, manger scenes for our Christmas celebration. Uh, we put up a whole manger scene and then we take it down. Uh, it's just part of the, the celebration and the holidays. Okay, here's another modern picture. This one's a little bit different. They just have lattice work up, but you notice they put these green branches over the top and they even hold them. And they have some other symbols now that they've associated with the, with the celebration. Hey, notice this shawl. What does that symbolize? 613, okay. And what does this symbolize? The border of their covenants, okay, uh, and all. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> here's the modern day Temple Mount. If you were wise and caught the, the deeper spirit of this course, you would be applying to study at the Jerusalem Center, which is right there. Okay? Uh, but here's the Temple Mount. So they, all Jews would have pilgrimaged to the Temple Mount. Herod's Temple would have been right here. Okay? Now, it's, it's also uh, a good point to introduce you just to the basic structure of Herod's Temple. So let me give you a quick outline of that. Herod's Temple was somewhat like our Temple Square is today, in that you had first the larger Temple Square area, which, which also was walled in, uh, and amazingly, today's Temple Mount, uh, right back here, this Temple Mount right here, it's actually about the size of our Temple Square today. Okay, uh, So that would have also been this esplanade here, uh, uh, and this top kind of uh, uh, paved area, that would have been about the same size as our Temple Square today. And in this paved area, and inner area, was, uh, was the, uh, the temple proper, which would have been right in the center, right where the Dome of the Rock is today. And here's an expanded view of the temple proper. The temple proper was an, uh, just a, uh, one 
a major building, Herod's Temple, with a lot of porticos and, and, and entry level and different uh, structures in addition to this main one, but they were all in the enclosed compound here, uh, or, the, or the wall, the second walled area. Have any of you been following the news in the last little while? Uh, there's been some stone throwing by some uh, Palestinian youth, and then the Jewish uh, army went up and, and stormed up on the top of, uh, of, uh, of the Dome of the Rock right here. Uh, that's, that's strictly forbidden. A Jordanian police force actually controls uh, this area up here. Jewish police are here. Palestinian police are here. Uh, but because of this rock throwing incident, the Jews kind of took control and went up here, and it, uh, it's very tense right now in Jerusalem. No, uh, no threat to any tourists, but it's very tense amongst the, uh, the local people that live there uh, and try to coexist. Okay, so here's the temple proper. Uh, in the temple proper, you have two sections. The first is the court of the women, and the second is the court of the priesthood, all right? So the court of the women, women could come in here. Uh, they, uh, they had the treasury where you would have changed the coins. Do you remember in today's reading, in John chapter 8, it said, these things spake Jesus as he was in the treasury of the temple. So we know he was precisely right there in Herod's temple. Okay, uh, then you have steps uh, from the court of the women that rise up. Uh, Herod's temple definitely had three levels. It's interesting in antiquity, when you study uh, 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 temples, quite often, if they have any origin or tie to Hebrew type or Hebrew culture, they will always have three levels. Those of you that have been to the temple, uh, our own temples, you'll recognize that symbolism. But nonetheless, then, uh, so they come up this gate, and then they go in through the priest, what they call the Nicanter gate, uh, and then they're into the court of the priests. And here's where all the temple sacrifices are done, the daily sacrifices. This is, and then Zacharias, when he offered the prayers as the priest, he would have then ascended these steps. No one else goes in but the priest for that day. Uh, and he would have gone in then and offered the sacrifice right here in the sanctuary. And then once a year, the chief high priest, he's the only one allowed, he goes into the Holy of Holies. Okay? And we'll study that. That's called the Day of Atonement. All right, so there's the layout. Let me show you some models. Here's a, a model that's 1 16th uh, the size over in a, in a Hebrew, in a Jewish museum in Jerusalem. You notice this is the entryway into the temple. It's a very secured entryway. This is the court of the women right here. Um, this is the treasury right here where Jesus would have been. And then this is Nicanter Gate. This is uh, along beyond this wall here. This is the temple proper, Herod's temple. And right down here is the, is the big platform for the sacrifices and the burnt offerings. And then Zacharias would have gone right through this door and done the daily offerings, okay? Uh, so here's an aerial view down here on the, on the altar. Now, here's, a, here's another model that's been constructed. It shows you that there was a wall here in the general area out here. There's a second reference to the temple in today's reading. One is that he spake, well, he, he said these things while he was in the treasury. The other one is when he's with the woman taken in adultery. It's highly unlikely that they would have brought the woman taken in adultery into the temple. Why? Because in the temple, then she would have defiled the temple and the temple, uh, the inner courtyard here. So they probably brought her into this area, which anybody could come up and still be in this area. They'd come up through these stairs right here and come right down here through what they call the hula gates. Okay, but going through here then was restricted, and then this was highly restricted. They've actually found the stone archaeologically that said, let no Jew pass beyond this point, uh, uh, or they risk their own life. But anyway, so in bringing the woman that's taken in adultery, that's probably out here in this courtyard. Why? One, because of the defilement issue, and the other, because the woman, uh, when, Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus is confronted with her situation, in order to, to kind of fry the, the accusers with their own conscience and their own guilt, he does what? He stoops down to write in the sand. And this, in all likelihood, would have been where they had kind of a sandy footing in here, rather than in the temple proper where it would have been paved. All right. So, uh, so this is probably the woman taken in adultery, and then this is where he's in with the treasury. Okay. 
Any questions? <laughs> I love that. Uh, 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 a class without questions. I'm, I'm free to move. Okay. So, and then here's uh, uh, Gilligan's Island. Uh, uh, no, anyway. Uh, but here's the guy who did that. I threw it in because in the, uh, in the model of the temple, now let me, let me stop and, and explain these pictures and then I'll come back to it. Uh, this right here is what's known as the Western Wall. That right along this line right here is all original wall for Herod's temple. Everything else has been rebuilt. Uh, but the Western Wall is uh, the holiest place for Jews because why? It's the only part of the tem Herod's temple that still remains. And they've even gone further. Right back through here, they've dug tunnels and they follow this wall underneath all the structures and they found the place that's, that's closest without going up on here, which is Palestinian territory. Uh, they found the closest place to where the Holy of Holies would have been, so that's kind of their, the place where everybody likes to go. But they come and, and put prayers, little put prayers in the wall. Friday evening, they begin the Sabbath day, uh, and so it's a, it's a very sacred place for Jews. Right up here, then, is the, is the most sacred place, third most sacred for Palestinian, or for uh, uh, Islams or Islam, okay, uh, Muslims, okay. Sorry, brain freeze. All right, this is Solomon's porches in the temple, probably where they were uh, they were uh, collecting different fees and things uh, uh, and the likes. Uh, this is Hulda the Gate. This is this is most uh, obviously going to be the entrance that Jesus would have gone through again and again. And we actually have uncovered, they've uncovered these steps right here, are the steps right in front of us right here. The Crusaders, bless their heart, built an abutting wall right here. But notice this arch right there. Let's see if I've got that picture there. Do you see the arches right there? Here's, you're going to see just this side of that arch. They built that stupid wall that comes right up here. Uh, but, uh, but here we go. So there's the arch. Can you kind of see the arch coming right up there in the brick outline? And the bricks here are different than here. Uh, and here's the steps coming up. Uh, this is one of those places where Jesus definitely would have stood. In fact, there's a cool little example. Do you remember uh, Neil Armstrong, the first one to step on the moon? Uh, our astronaut, he was a very devout Christian. Later on in his life, uh, he, was, uh, he took his little group of parishioners over uh, to the Holy Land, and they had a tour, and they went around to different places. When they came to this spot with their Israeli guide, uh, Neil asked the guide, Sir, is there any place where I can be certain that I'm standing exactly where Jesus would have stood uh, when he was alive here on the earth? And the guide said, Well, this is the original gate for uh, the common people going into the temple, and right down here at the base of that is a, is a threshold stone, which was an original threshold stone. And you can see how smooth it is, and it's worn over. I don't have the exact picture of the threshold stone here, but uh, uh, Neil Arm, uh, and he said, Jesus certainly put his foot on that stone as he was going into the temple. And then Neil Armstrong, let's see if i got a picture here. I think I, no, I don't. Uh, Neil Armstrong then uh, looked at that stone, and here was his group right here. And, and he just stepped over onto the stone, looked back at the rest of his little congregation there and said, folks, I've taken important steps before in my life, but never one as important as this one. It's kind of a cool little, uh, a little uh, anecdote from, uh, from our late astronaut. Okay, so this then is the temple. Uh, anything else? Oh, I wanted to show you, I wanted to show you this scene because uh, at the end of the ceremony of the, I am the, uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, they would light great tan candelabra in the, in the temple. Uh, you, you remember the menorah is the symbol for Judaism, uh, the seven candlestick holder, and it symbolizes a completion, and it was the candlestick of the temple. It, these same candlesticks then were out uh, around the temple in giant form, and at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, it's recorded, uh, people surmise, they, uh, they, they would end the ceremony, uh, the end of the whole holiday uh, Feast of Tabernacles, with lighting these candles. And scholars, many scholars, 
conjecture that it's at that moment when these candles were ablaze and the lights have gone, or the sun's gone down, it's just such contrast that Jesus stands up in front of one of them and says, I am the light of the world. Pretty, pretty cool symbolism, okay? Or maybe some, con some reason it would have been after uh, the uh, candles are extinguished in the dark and Jesus then stands up and says, I am the light of the world speaking out of the darkness and kind of calling people towards it. You, you, can, you can imagine it the, the way you will, but, uh, but uh, I kind of think it, it might have been when the lights are all ablaze that he stands up and says, hey folks, I am the real light of the world. Okay. Well, let's take it then. Uh, where are we going here with the PowerPoint? So not that one. Uh, all right, let's take it from this... Uh, from this point, uh, let's go to the man born blind and just kind of work our way back. When you open to John chapter 9, we have this classic example. Do you remember the writing style of John? It's uh, Scholars call it discursive because he includes so much of the discourse of Jesus and his conversation with the people that he heals. Um, uh, so, uh, once again... Uh, John's counting the miracles, and he presents them in full form with lots of discussion. So, first off, you have the miracle. Uh, as Jesus passes by, uh, the disciples ask him, a master, they see a blind man, and they say, master who sinned, this man or his parents? Uh, and Jesus answers, neither, in verse 3, um, but that the works of God might be manifest in him. Okay, let's take just a half second and explore something. Uh, the... Uh, the Jewish mindset at the time of Jesus was very focused on what is known as the law of retribution. And that was, for every sin that somebody uh, committed, there was an immediate punishment. And so whenever they saw somebody that had uh, an affliction or a malady or anything else, they had a one-to-one -one relationship that somebody's done something to offend God. Uh, now, Jesus dispels that notion, but you and I should realize, too, that when we hit hard times, things that we would not uh, elect to have happen to ourselves, what the very, one of the first things we do is we revert back to that notion. And we almost always will ask ourselves when something very difficult uh, comes our way, be it our parents getting divorced, or be it uh, stumbling, or be it a catastrophic accident, or anything like that, and we'll always ask what? Why is God doing this to me? In this example here, Jesus dispels that forcefully. He says, they ask, so who sinned that this guy had, was born blind and never has been able to see a thing in his life? And Jesus said what? Neither, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, uh, certainly bad things happen when people do uh, sin and things. There always has to be consequences, but not all bad things in life are the result of sin. We learn that from Alma chapter 7 and, and other things that, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Second Nephi chapter 2. There's, their opposition is a part of the fallen world. Uh, and so uh, the second half is that, uh, notice what the second reason is why uh, bad things happen to us, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. Often difficult things happen to us because difficult things point us in one of two directions, more directly to God or away from Him. And certainly God would like us, like those things that challenge us in life, to point us more directly towards Him. So Jesus says, neither one, but that, that I might show you forth my works. And then he, uh, then he stops to heal the man, instructs him to go down at the pool of Siloam, and that's a pretty cool thing because today they've archaeologically excavated. They know exactly where the Pool of Siloam was. And if you're smart enough to ever get over in the Jerusalem Center program or otherwise, you will sit on these steps to the Pool of Siloam and you'll read John chapter 9. It's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, so he instructs him to go down there. Uh, he goes down, he washes, uh, and he receives his sight. Now, an interesting aftermath of that, uh, the people then come... Uh, because, uh, let's see, is there a Sabbath day violation in here? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was on the Sabbath day. It's almost like every other miracle seems to occur on the Sabbath day. So who's going to be after him? The Pharisees are going to be all inflamed because he's broken the Sabbath day. They're bro he's broken their oral traditions, remember? Their Mishnaic things. And he said, okay. And, and so 
they then come after, they can't find him, but the Pharisees and their crowd come after his parents. And what do his parents say? This is fascinating. His parents dodge the issue. They say, we don't know who healed him, but uh, he's of age, go and ask him. Now, and then John tells you why the parents don't come clean and tell him. And why is it? Because they fear to be kicked out of the synagogue. See, Jesus hasn't, hasn't just immediately put forth his, uh, his church on the earth. And people that are even following him still, their faith is in the law and things. And so they don't want to be kicked out of their church. So uh, you see that the parents are devout. Then, if you go over to the second half of the chapter, uh, they catch up to him, and there's this really terse conversation. But don't you just love the way the young man, uh, or the man that's been born blind, the way he just holds his ground? The Pharisees come at him, and they say, uh, you know, uh, who healed you, and why are you sinning on the Sabbath day? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and what does he answer them? Uh, he says, I don't know, but this much I know, I was blind, and I'm seeing now. And they just say, oh, that was altogether born in sin. And they just cast him off, okay? And, and he's feeling somewhat dejected, you know? Uh, and uh, that he's cast out. And they, when Jesus comes to him in verse 35, dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now notice how the Spirit's working on him. Uh, and he said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Now, I suspect he knows already from word of mouth that Jesus has declared himself as the Son of God discreetly. But when he comes to him and asks him that uh, by saying, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him, really what he's saying is, I do, and will you reveal yourself to me directly? And Jesus say, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee, and then the Spirit just washes over the man. This is so parallel to the woman at the well. And what does the, what is the, what is the young man say? Lord, I believe. Uh, and, uh, and he worships him. And then Jesus gives this little, uh, kind of, this little uh, uh, monologue almost here where he says, I am come that they that are blind might, uh, uh, might see and those that are uh, see might be made blind. And then you pick up an interesting line here. It appears that he's in the audience of the Pharisees when he says that, or casts that thought, throws that thought out there. And the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, Duh. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He wasn't disrespectful. Uh, but he said, uh, 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 Yeah, uh, yeah. If you are willing to take it on the chin, you are blind. You're not recognizing me. So there's the first great example of light and darkness. Very accentuated. The second one, uh, the woman taken in adultery. Uh, why is that? A, it's, we're in John chapter 8. Why is the woman taken in adultery uh, an obvious set of... Now we don't need to look at that. Uh, uh, why is the woman taken in adultery... Uh, uh, what, are they, what are they trying to do? Let's see. In, in chapter 8... Oh, I should also tell you something. In chapter 8, in the oldest manuscripts that they found... The first 11 verses of chapter 8 are not in the oldest manuscripts, but they were added in subsequent manuscripts. Um, and because the passage seems to fit so well, I think it's been left in the King, King James. I don't know if John actually put that in there or if a later editor put, put it in. But uh, Joseph Smith didn't change it a lot, and it just does seem like it fits. And so sometimes you'll find John chapter 8, the first 11 verses, in an appendix in other Bibles. But in, in our King James, it's right there. It says, uh, uh, and Jesus went into the Mount of Olives in verse 1, and early in the morning he came into the temple, uh, and the scribes and Pharisees brought into him a woman taken in adultery. Now, uh, <clears throat> why, why are they, it says uh, that they're... Um, um, and they set him in their midst, and they and they put pit him against the Mosaic law, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, and they want him to uh, to go ahead and condemn her to death, as the Mosaic law says that somebody that's taken in adultery uh, should be punished that way and be stoned. Now, uh, are they just trying to see if Jesus will follow the Mosaic law? Uh, one 
as scholars have pointed out, although Talmadge too in his account, that um, Rome had reserved for them the right of capital punishment. So in, in the sense that the Jewish law said, take a person's life because of this sin or crime, uh, Rome said, no, we're in charge. So in, in some uh, ways, Jesus is, they're trying to squeeze in between the Roman occupation and the Jewish law and see if he'll take sides. Either way, he's going to be in trouble. Okay? And so they bring him. It's, I mentioned before, it's an obvious setup because this sin takes two to tango. And they only bring one person, the woman. Okay? Uh, and in all likelihood, the lecherous man uh, that, uh, that was you know, ha uh, having an adulterous act with her, uh, he's probably even in the congregation there, uh, as repulsive as that is. Uh, but what does Jesus do? He says, uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, a uh, real common refrain, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then he stoops down. There's lots of speculation about whether or not he's writing the Mosaic Law there, uh, 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 whether or not he's just doodling in the sand so that their consciences will convict them. But whatever it is, it works really well. The, people, the, the accusers file out, and he's left just with this pitiful woman, uh, who's been uh, taken in the very act of adultery uh, and, then, and then thrown out in the middle of the public square. She must have looked a mess. Uh, uh, she must have, I, you suspect she didn't have any eye contact with Jesus. Uh, and then he says to her, woman, where are thine accusers? Neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. You should be aware that one of our prophets has felt very strongly about what this act symbolized. In President Kimball's uh, great book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, he stated, as when Jesus says, go and sin no more, there is no sign of forgiveness here. It does sound like it unless you read it carefully, and really what Jesus is saying is, go, start on the path of repentance. Now that's important to us as LDS probably because of the doctrinal position that adultery is the third most serious sin or fornication that a person can commit in this life. That's Alma chapter 39, it's where that's explained. And so, uh, it, it just, this just sounds like Jesus slaps her hand and forgives her and, and everything's, everything's put back together again. Uh, but President Kimball weighed in and interpreted this account as this is the beginning of her repentance process. So, uh, uh, any questions on that? <laughs> Love that phrase. All right. Uh, let's, uh, uh, since you don't have any questions, at least not that I can hear, uh, let me take you back to the third example then of the, uh, of the soldiers that go to arrest him and the Nicodemus stepping forth. Uh, now, once again, how many, uh, who writes about Nicodemus? Just John. And here's the second appearance. And in this account, and we pick it up uh, in verse 40, uh, they're beginning to believe that he's a prophet. Uh, the Pharisees in verse 30 heard all the people that are, that are starting to, to believe and everything else and what he's saying and that just upsets their apple cart. And so they send uh, officers to arrest him, just their own little militia. That's verse 32 of chapter 7. And then verse uh, uh, 45 is where we pick it up. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and they say unto him, Why have ye not brought him? Officers answered, "Never spake like man like this. Never spake like this. Never man spake like this man." So that's verse forty-six. So what are they saying with that? And they say, "Never man spake like this man." We felt the spirit. So here's here's hardened kind of army uh, national guard type officers, and they're sent to arrest Jesus, and they stand there before arresting him and make the state a mistake to listen to him. And what happens? Their hearts touch. It's pretty cool, okay? Uh, uh, not even necessarily religious people. Their hearts touch, and so they don't arrest him. They come back. They're that moved. And, uh, uh, and then the, the Pharisees are just livid. They answer the Pharisees, uh, uh, then answer the Pharisees, are you also deceived? Uh, and uh, uh, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But, the, uh, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. You know what that reminds me of? Forgive the example. But this is Princess Bride all over. When, uh, when Fezzik has hired the Andre the Giant uh, to, to kill uh, you know, uh, Wesley or whatever, and, uh, uh, and, or he's, he's giving him instructions, and, 
uh, and physic or uh, yeah, um, the giant starts to starts to argue a little bit. Well, that's not very fair. And the, and Fezzik looks right back at him and goes, "What? I didn't hire you to think." <laughs> it's exactly what the Pharisees say to the to their soldiers there. All right, but then we get the conversation gets more interesting, and he says, "Then answered them, uh, uh, and then the then the Pharisees go into their reason." Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him, but this people who knoweth not the law? But then Nicodemus, who knows the law, okay, remember, conqueror of the people is what his name stands for. He's willing to stand up to his colleagues there. And, uh, and, but John identifies him as the one who came by night. He didn't need to tell us he came by night. We already knew that. But he wants to remind you something. Okay, and then uh, Nicodemus says, Doth our law judge the man before he doeth it? Uh, and they look at him and say, um, Art thou also of Galilee? See, that's a slur. Galilee was hip town. Are, are you also from the farm area of Bumpkin? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And then Nicodemus just fades back into the woodwork and doesn't say anything more. For somebody that has been trained in the law, a, a Pharisee no less, a ruler of the people, Nicodemus, uh, certainly would have known the fallacious nature of their accusation. And that's what? They say, search and see, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Are you kidding me? That was, that was Hebrew Seminary 101, first day. Who came out of Galilee? Elijah the Tishbite, <laughs> fire from heaven. <laughs> and Jonah and others. Uh, you don't have to reach at all to find an answer to their accusation. But Nicodemus doesn't respond. Because why? Because John is bringing him out of light. He's not quite courageous enough. And he just dives back in at, at the first little pushback. So what are we saying here? Uh, then with this whole uh, expose of John as he writes to us about Jesus, he's bringing us about to things of light. The man who's born blind, he uses the image of light. The woman in adultery, light and darkness. Nicodemus, light and darkness. Uh, and so the, the issue then comes back to us when Jesus stands up and says in a bombastic way, I am the light of the world. How much light is a part of our lives? How much do we associate with him and let his light show through us? Um, my, my own observation is, you are people of light. You, you, goodness shows, even in your countenances. I think Alma realized his, realized his promise when he says, you'll have a change in your countenance. Um, but there's a classic example that, I, that comes from our Jerusalem Center, so I just have to share it with you. When the Jerusalem Center was trying to be built, there were, there were worldwide protests, and they were led by the, by the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. Everybody came out of the work, woodwork. And after the building had been start, it was, it was even doubtful that it would be able to finish because the mayor had given us approval, but there was, this, there was this huge public pushback. It was international news. It was back before your time, 1988, 1989. But finally, through some small miracles, they pushed the construction forward. Uh, um, vigilantes didn't just tear it down. And when they were ready to move in, they moved the students in at night. They didn't even want people noticing. But in the reason why people back down is the first presidency, specifically Elder Faust, uh, President Hunter at the time, and Elder Holland, gave a pledge to the ultra-Orthodox Jews that no Mormon would ever proselyte or open their mouth about Mormonism in Jerusalem, as long as the center was there. And so when they had a, when they had a special signing ceremony, uh, they went over to actually sign some official documents saying this. When they signed, President Faust told them the experience where one of the ministers, one of the ultra-Orthodox ministers, looked at him and said, you have signed, I know you all Mormons are honest people, but what are we going to do about the light? And President Faust looks back at him and said, what light? And then the minister said, the light that shines in your students' eyes. Oh, it was the coolest thing. Yes, they noticed that we're different. And then the following the Savior even changes your countenance. That you and I would be people that reflect light and the light of the Savior in our lives such that other people can even recognize that is my prayer. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.